So today moving on with our series for dermatopathology for residents, we are on lecture number nine, which is perivascular dermatitis. So again, when you talk about perivascular dermatitis, the first thing to think of is what kind of inflammation do I see in the dermis? Usually you'll see a lot of lymphocytes, but then like you have to look, go high power and see, is it only purely lymphocytes or are there any admixed eosinophils? Or, there, or is it predominantly neutrophils, maybe mast cells or plasma cells. So based on that, you can then narrow down your list of differential diagnosis to a few. So let's start with perivascular dermatitis with eosinophils. So here's a case, 54 year old female who presents with pruritic morbiliform rash for five days. So you can see this morbiliform rash and when you look at the biopsy, so here we have a punch biopsy of the skin. Let's make it straight. And on low power, we can see the, the perivascular inflammation in the dermis, superficial and deep. So you go down and look at the players. So there's a lot of lymphocytes, predominantly lymphocytes that you can see here. But then if you scan this slide at high power and start looking carefully, we also see a lot of admixed eosinophils. You can see all these orange granules. So there is a lot of admixed eosinophils. So your diagnosis is perivascular dermatitis with eosinophils. So when you're talking about perivascular dermatitis with eosinophils, your three main differential diagnoses are drug, bug, or an articarial phase of Bullous femphigoid. So this was a drug hypersensitive reaction which usually presents with pruritic morbiliform eruption often starting at the trunk and expanding to the arms and the legs usually after 7 to 10 days after the medication. So histologically you are going to see the superficial and deep perivascular inflammation composed predominantly of lymphocytes and some admixed eosinophils. The other differential diagnosis to consider in such <coughs> uh, histological presentation is arthropod bite reaction, which clinically presents with edematous, pruritic, red papules, which can sometimes progress to vesicles and even bulla. Histologically, again, you see the superficial and middermal, maybe sometimes even deep perivascular inflammation. You go down, you look at the players and you can see like there's a little big eosinophilic party going on actually a ton of eosinophils add mixed with the lymphocytes so the reaction pattern is still the same and given the presence of eosinophils you're going to talk about drug bug or bp one thing that we have normally seen like sometimes other features that can sometimes help you out is some of the drug reactions that maybe can show you some kind of dyskeratosis within the epidermis when you look at an arthropod bite reaction, it is usually a single lesion. It's not a rash. It could be like a few multiple lesions, but not throughout the uh, body. And another feature that is not present here that we have commonly seen is that this infiltrate tends to go into the subcutis. And you tend to see a lot of eosinophils in the subcutis in an arthropod bite reaction. So look for these features. If you don't have a clinical history, they might help you make a better diagnosis. And then never forget articarial phase of BP if, even if the patient is old, if the patient is like 70 years old, 80 years old, and you see these patterns, then you definitely, even if you don't see the bulla, you still have to always keep articarial BP in your differential because this can present with generalized pruritus with only articarial papules and plaques and no bulla. One feature that we have seen is you can see the perivascular inflammation. You see the eosinophils and the patient is scratching quite a bit. So it is causing all the scale crust on the top. But one feature that we often see in articarial phase of BP is that the eosinophils tend to go within the epidermis. You can see a lot of eosinophils within the epidermis. Some actually lining up the dermal epidermal junction. So that is a characteristic feature that you'll see many times if the underlying diagnosis is articarial phase of BP. So you still see the eosinophils in the dermis, but then you tend to start see also eosinophilic exocytosis and 
some eosinophils lining the dermal epidermal junction. That is another clue that this might be BPU. So if you pick, look at the clinical history, the patient is usually an older individual. And then you can pick up the phone and ask some more clinical history. And if it is suspicious, then you can advise immunofluorescence testing so that the patient can get the right diagnosis. Other diagnoses that you might want to consider sometimes with eosinophil, which are not common, are one is pruritic and articular papules and plaques of pregnancy, and the other is Well syndrome. So in pup, which the clinical history is very important. First, the patient is going to be pregnant. Without that, you are not going to make the diagnosis of pup, basically. And in the, on histology, what do we see is a very mild spongiotic reaction pattern, which might be there or might not show any spongiosis. And in the dermis, you see this perivascular inflammation of come predominantly of lymphocytes. And then if you go high power, you're going to see some admixed eosinophils. So you can see the admixed eosinophils here. So nothing very spectacular that will give you like a very specific diagnosis. So a very important uh, uh, point to make this diagnosis is clinical pathological correlation. Without that, you cannot make the diagnosis. So you need to have the history of a pregnant female presenting with, <coughs> with, with, with a rash. And then you see this biopsy where you see this superficial and mid-dermal perivascular inflammation. And then the eosinophils. Uh, herpes gestationis might also show you a very similar feature. It might even show you the bulla, but herpes gestationis, the immunofluorescence will show you a very strong C3 at the dermal epidermal junction, and you will also see sometimes IgG. So to differentiate between the two, then you do need the immunofluorescence testing. Well syndrome is going to show you tons of eosinophils with the uh, flame figures, which so we didn't uh, we didn't pull out a slide because it's very very similar to the drug bite, but with a lot of flame figures. Moving on to predominantly lymphocytes. So now we go in and we don't see any eosinophils. It is mostly lymphocytes. So here's a case: 32 year old male presented with this asymptomatic erythematous, very annular lesion on the legs and the buttock. So you can see this annular plaque on the legs and the buttock. So what do we see histologically here? Let's make this slide a little bit straight. Okay, here. So again, we see a perivascular inflammation in the dermis. And you go high power, it is mostly composed of only lymphocytes here. You don't see any eosinophils. You might sometimes see one or two that doesn't rule this diagnosis out, but it is predominantly a lymphocytic infiltrate. The characteristic feature that you see here is this lymphocytes are forming like a very tight sleeve, coat sleeve around the blood vessel. So like you can see like they are very almost hugging the blood vessel and forming like a tight coat sleeve. So this pattern of tight uh, coat sleeve pattern that you see here where you see the lymphocytes forming like a very tight ring around the uh, blood vessels is very characteristic of erythema annulare centrifugum. So if you see this uh, uh, superficial and mid-dermal or even sometimes deep perivascular inflammation composed predominantly of lymphocytes with this very tight coat sleeve pattern, then you have to think of EAC. Uh, histologically, there are two patterns that have been described. One is a superficial EAC and one is a superficial and deep EAC. Uh, the superficial EAC might show you some spongiosis on the in the epidermis and the deep superficial and deep is going to show you inflammation that is going quite deep but very little spongiosis but the characteristic feature that you want to look for is this tight coat sleeve pattern around the blood vessels if you have only have lymphocytes the uh, so erythema annularis centrifugum it may so we already talked about the superficial and the deep and the deep may be more infiltrative and lacks the scale clinically. Viral exanthem is another consideration when you see just a superficial and mid-dermal perivascular lymphocytes only with lymphocytes. You don't see any other cell type basically. So it's a non-specific generalized morbiliform eruption, but obviously there might be some history of fever that will help you make the diagnosis. So picking up the phone and talking is very important to your dermatologist. So let's go to this biopsy, oh sorry. Here, so 
So we, what we see here is a very non-specific histological pattern where you see the superficial and mid-dermal, very vascular inflammation with some lymphocytes, but not any other cell type. So it's predominantly lymphocytes that you see around the vessel. So it's a mild, superficial and mid-dermal perivascular lymphocytic infiltrate. One feature that you might see in a viral exanthem is if you look at the dermis very, epidermis very careful, carefully, you might see some scattered dyskeratotic cells. And that feature sometimes helps you make the diagnosis actually. So if you see a mild scattered dyskeratotic cells, that is another helpful clue for either a viral exanthem. And even sometimes in drug eruption, you might see the mild scattered dyskeratosis within the epidermis. So superficial and mid-dermal perivascular lymphocytic infiltrate with some scattered dyskeratosis plus or minus. There's even some mild spongiosis, so very non-specific, but then you have to think of a viral exanthem. Other diagnosis that you have to consider when you see predominantly lymphocytes in the in the dermis is pleva, but pleva also has a lot of epidermal changes that help you make the diagnosis. So clinically, this will present with recurrent crops of scattered papules and macules at varying stages. So some are crusted, some are about to crust, some are just developing. So they are at various stages. And it's usually a younger kid between 10 to 20 years of old. And then in the biopsy, this is a very nice case of pleva. So let's make it straight. Yeah. So what do we see? <coughs> So I always stress on going from the epidermis to the dermis. So in the, epiderm in the epidermis, we start from the top, you see hyperkeratosis. You see a lot of parakeratosis. Within the epidermis, you see a lot of spongiotic changes with a lot of lymphocytic exocytosis. So you see a lot of lymphocytes going within the epidermis. Uh, very characteristically, you're going to see a lot of dyskeratotic cells within the epidermis. So you see all these dyskeratotic cells. You see vacuolar interface change at the dermal epidermal junction. And then in the dermis, you see a predominantly perivascular and interstitial lymphocytic infiltrate that has this very characteristic wedge pattern. So if you go low power, it has this wedge pattern that you see here. So the triangular shaped, inverted triangular, inverted triangle shape. So the 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 one point of the triangle is here and then this is the base of the triangle. So the epidermis is the base and then this is the tip of the triangle. So that is the pattern of inflammation that you're going to see in pleva actually. And if you go high power, you might see some admixed and neutrophils by around the vessels, but not too many. And one thing that has been shown in multiple studies is you don't see eosinophils in pleva. So you have to remember that if you see eosinophils, then you have to think more of drug rather than pleva actually. So look carefully for any eosinophils. Pleva usually does not have any eosinophils. Clinically, the differential diagnosis is going to be a CD30 lymphoproliferative disorder. And many times clinically, you might get the clinician putting it on the differential diagnosis. So you might want to do a CD30. And if the CD30 if you see a few scattered cells that doesn't make it to the diagnosis, if pleva, arthropod bite, all these can show you a few scattered CD30 positive cells. To make a diagnosis of lymphomatoid papillosis, you need more than 75% of the cells staining with CD30. So a few scattered CD30 doesn't make it to lymphomatoid papillosis. And when pleva becomes chronic, then it, uh, it is called pityriasis, like you know, it is chronica. So in these cases, the patient will present with these crops of red-brown papules that have been there for quite some time. Again, it is the younger age group. And histologically now, the changes are a little bit more similar, but now the wedge-shaped inflammation is gone, basically. So now the inflammation is mostly limited to the superficial venous plexus. And there's a lot of lymphocytic exocytosis still present is mild spongiosis. You still see the hyperkeratosis, the parakeratosis. You're still going to see the dyskeratosis within the epidermis. So you want to see all these features for pityriasis, like in Oedis chronica. And because it has been present for quite some time, you're going to see some mild fibrotic changes within the papillary dermis. So that also helps in making the diagnosis. 
So hyperkeratosis, parakeratosis, mild spongiosis, dyskeratosis, vacuolar interface changes, lymphocytic exocytosis, uh, superficial perivascular lymphocytic infiltrate, some going into the middermis with mild fibrosis are all the features that you want to see to make the diagnosis of PLC. Another diagnosis that you need to consider when you predominantly see lymphocytes is perniosis. So this clinically will present with red purple nodules on the fingers and the toes. Histologically, the important feature to remember is perniosis is an, like a lesion on the acral side. So it's usually going to be an acral skin. So important feature for your exam point of view that if you see an acral biopsy, then you have to think of perniosis. What are the other features that we see here? We talked about the perivascular lymphocytic infiltrate that you see here. Acral skin, so you see the thick hyperkeratosis. Uh, another characteristic feature that is associated with perniosis is the papillary dermal edema that you see here. So papillary dermal edema that has also been described in PMLE and sweets. So papillary dermal edema. Some dyskeratosis within the epidermis is also evident here. You can see one. And then you see this perivascular, superficial and deep lymphocytic infiltrate. And uh, one characteristic feature that we have seen mostly in all cases of perniosis is the infiltrate also tends to go around the eucrine duct. So if you go into the deep part of the dermis, you're going to see this peri-eucrine lymphocytic infiltrate. And we have seen them in most cases of perniosis actually. So if you see that, so peri superficial and deep perivascular predominantly lymphocytic infiltrate, papillary dermal edema and the inflammation going deep into the dermis around the eucrine structures. These are characteristic features that you will see in perniosis. Moving on, so one of the, the final diagnosis, if you see predominantly lymphocytes is pigmented purpuric dermatosis. So this has multiple clinical patterns. The most common one is Schambach's disease, which we'll see a slide of, but it could, there, there are other patterns known as Majoki's disease when they present with this annular lesions or the pigmented purpuric dermatosis of Gujarat and Blum, where you see this red violaceous lichen, lichenoid papule. So they are more lichenoid. And then lichen aureus, which will present with this yellow brown macules also on the lower extremities. So again, the pattern is the perivascular lymphocytic infiltrate that you see here. So let's go high power. You can see the perivascular. It's usually in the superficial part of the dermis. So you can see the super perivascular lymphocytic infiltrate, but it is a purpuric lesion and the purpura, the purpuric means it's a red. Uh, it looks very brownish red and the brownish red color is because these lesions tend to have a lot of red cell extravasation. So you can see a lot of red cell extravasation associated with the perivascular lymphocytic infiltrate in Schamburg's disease or pigmented purpuric dermatosis. Uh, <clears throat> there's usually a, some mild spongiosis, but you don't have to see that. Mostly you're going to see the perivascular lymphocytic infiltrate with a lot of red cell extravasation that you see here. And if you do a hemosiderin stain, you uh, so if you do an pearls iron stain, you're going to see admixed hemosiderin within most lesions of PPD or pigmented purpuric dermatosis. Moving on to now predominantly neutrophils. So if you see a lot of neutrophils, what do you need to think of basically? So here's a case, 36 year old male with past medical history of Crohn's, he presents with this febrile, uh, who's also like febrile and now is presenting with this new tender red papule, papular nodules on the arms and the legs that you can see here. So let's look at the biopsy. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so here's the biopsy here. Sorry, you already saw the diagnosis, but it's okay. So what do we see here predominantly? So predominantly we see a lot of dense, a very busy dermis. And in the dermis you see mostly neutrophils here. So there's some lymphocytes, but it's mostly this neutrophil. So you can see this multi-lobulated nuclei and that is very, very characteristic of neutrophils. So one, two, three lobule, uh, lobules and then one, two, three. So multi-lobulated nuclei. That is very, very correct. So that tells you that these are all neutrophil. So it's a dense neutrophilic infiltrate also known as neutrophilic 
dermatosis actually. So whenever we see a lot of neutrophils, the first question that you should always ask yourself is, do I see any vasculitis? So you have to first go high power and then look at the vessels around. So you look at the superficial venous plexus here and I don't see any evidence of vasculitis. I don't see any fibrinoid degeneration around the vessel wall. And so there is no vasculitis. So once you have ruled that out, then this is neutrophilic dermatosis that is very classic for sweet syndrome. So in sweet syndrome, you're going to see a very dense neutrophilic infiltrate. You might see some admixed lymphocytes. We have seen cases where there's a lot of admixed, uh, there's a large number of eosinophils also, so that doesn't rule it out. And then very classically, you're going to see this papillary dermal edema. So papillary dermal edema and a dense neutrophilic dermatosis, then you can always think of sweet syndrome and no vasculitis. So sweet syndrome, also called acute febrile neutrophilic dermatosis, and we already saw the clinical presentation actually. So this is again the same slide. And then one thing that you have to remember is, that is a reaction pattern, neutrophilic dermatosis. And you have to do a clinical pathological correlation to make the diagnosis of sweets. So if the patient is presenting with a, a histology of sweets but has lesions that are limited to the dorsal hands, then you have to think of postular dermatosis of the dorsal hands. If the patient has had an history of a jejunoileal bypass or has history of Crohn's or some sort of a bowel disease, then you have to think of bowel-associated dermatitis arthritis syndrome because that also histologically will present similar to what you saw in sweets. That is a neutrophilic dermatosis. Uh, rheumatoid neutrophilic dermatosis also presents with a lot of neutrophils in the dermis. <coughs> this one also tends to have some plasma cells and eosinophils. So if you see that, you pick up the phone and ask if the patient has any history of rheumatoid nodules and any other condition that are associated with connective tissue disease. Another condition to think of when you see predominantly neutrophils is pyoderma gangrenosum. So pyoderma gangrenosum present with four subtypes. It could be ulcerative, it could be pustular, it could be bullous, or it could be vegetative. The important feature that you see both clinically and histologically is this undermined ulcer that you see here. So you can see this ulcer that is undermined and violaceous, so the violaceous is because it's partly necrotic. So when you look at a slide also, you see the same features where you can see the epidermal ulceration and the undermined ulcer. So very classically, you see this epidermal ulceration and undermining ulcer that you saw also, histologically also. And then again, the same pattern of neutrophilic dermatosis. So you see a lot of neutrophils in the dermis. One thing that we also see in sweets is, usually there is associated folliculitis. And also when you look at the infiltrate, there is also a lot of other admixed cell types. So you'll see macrophages, lymphocytes, and that is the reason many times we always do a lot of stains to rule out any kind of infectious etiology. Because cellulitis can sometimes present like this, uh, atypical mycobacteria, defungal infections. So I have to make sure that you rule all those out. And then obviously the clinical pathological correlation with the undermining ulcer the neutrophilic abscesses, the dense neutrophilic infiltrate that is going deep, then helps you make the diagnosis of pyoderma gangrenosum. And then moving on to plasma cells. So if you go high power and you see a admixed plasma cells, you have to think of two conditions. <clears throat> so the first one is, so here is a biopsy that you see here that shows perivascular dermatitis. So it is superficial and deep. But then when you go high power, you see admixed plasma cells within the infiltrate. So you can see these plasma cells here. There's another one here. So whenever you see this admixed plasma cells, you have to think of two conditions. One, obviously, very common is syphilis, that you always have to do the spirochete stain to make the to look for any Borrelia organisms. And the other one is Lyme disease. So superficial and deep perivascular dermatitis with admixed plasma cells, you have to think of Lyme disease. So this is a biopsy from a patient of syphilis. So when you go high power, you can see that there are admixed plasma cells here actually. Let's find some plasma cells. Here's a nice plasma cell here that you see here. There's another one here. 
So if you look at this biopsy, another thing that is very classic for uh, secondary syphilis is it always tends to present with a combination of reaction patterns. So here you can see that there is some sort of a psoriasiform hyperplasia. There's also some sort of a lichen or infiltrate and then you have a superficial and mid-dermal perivascular dermatitis. So psoriasiform, lichenoid and a perivascular dermatitis. So if you see combination of reaction patterns, always think of syphilis. And then if you go high power, you're going to find the plasma cells, you do the spirochete stain, and then you can easily make the diagnosis of syphilis actually. Another feature that uh, doctor that is very famously known that uh, from Dr. Elston is this retter ridges that you see here. They are this very thin and long retter ridges and he calls them sexy retter ridges actually. So you can see this very thin and long sexy retter ridges, which is another feature for secondary syphilis actually. And uh, the books will also describe endothelial hyperplasia. So some of the blood vessels tend to show large endothelial cells. So you can see this endothelial hyperplasia. And those are all very classic features for secondary syphilis. So this is a clinical picture of a Lyme patient where you can see this 23 year old female that presents with an asymptomatic enlarging annular plaque on her lower back that started five days. And then when you look at the biopsy, you're going to see the perivascular superficial and deep with plasma cells. Uh, you can do a spirochete stain. We talk about spirochete stain being positive in Lyme, but very, very uncommon. The better way to make the diagnosis would be through serology. So Lyme disease now presents with these annular lesions and they can also present with chronic arthritis and mild encephalopathy. And then syphilis secondary will present with this asymptomatic pink to brown annular scaly thin plaques on the trunk extremities and especially the palms and the soles. And then when you do the biopsy, you see this combination of reaction patterns with admixed plasma cells. And then with the positive spirochete, you can make the diagnosis. And finally, we come to mast cells. If you see more mast cells in the biopsy with in admixed lymphocytes. So here is a biopsy that you see that shows superficial and mid-dermal mid perivascular, a very mild infiltrate. And then there, there is admixed mast cells. So you can see the mast cells here. So all these are, so here's a nice mast cell that you see here. So this uh, fried omelet appearance where you see the central nucleus and the cytoplasm. So there are scattered mast cells, superficial and mid-dermal perivascularly. And the other feature that you see here is this dilated vessels that you see here. So you see the still injectasia. So this is usually older patients with dilated vessels and then a superficial and mid-dermal perivascular mild infiltrate that is predominantly composed of these round and spindled mast cells. You tend to see a lot of spindled mast cells if you do a leader stain. Some of the spindle cells that you see around the vessels are going to be stain positive with the leader, tryptase or CD117. So this is, uh, when you see this pattern with increased mass cell, this is telangiectasia macularis eruptiva persistens, which we call TMAP. So this is a form of cutaneous mastocytosis with red-brown macules and patches and clinically also you'll see the fine telangiectasias and then histologically also you see the telangiectasia. If this was a younger kid, like one year, less than one year of old, then you have to think of urticaria pigmentosa, which presents with this pink brown macules, but here the mast cells tend to be almost forming like nodules actually. So like this is not like scattered mast cells. When you go high power, you can see that this is almost like a nodular proliferation of cells. And then when you go high power, you can see the very classic fried egg appearance. So you see the central nucleus and then the cytoplasm so all these are mast cells you can always do the stain but even on low power at this like on the HNE you can see the fried egg appearance so you know this is mastocytosis or urticaria pigmentosa so i think that was the last slide so if you want any additional in-depth information images and digital slides for any of these topics go to publications.pathpresenter.net uh, look up Dermatopathology for Resident. This is a free resource created by 65 authors and you will find a lot of additional uh, histological features, clinical features and images about the all the entities that we talked about. Thank you.
and talk to you next time.